I get the most joy out of travel when I travel by bike. It's a lot of fun to be out in the sun getting exercise while also sightseeing and experiencing new cultures. But it's more than just fun. It feels liberating in a certain kind of way. There's a sort of freedom in knowing that you can travel around the world, or at least a small part of the world if your trip is shorter, just by the strength of your own two feet. Last summer, three of us took a trip to Greece to exercise some of that freedom and find a little adventure along the way. My friends Bobby and Natalie, who I toured southern Portugal with last year, joined me again this time on the other side of Europe. We met up in the capital, Athens, with our bikes, one of the only parts of the trip we planned ahead of time. We felt like we established a good kind of rhythm last time and didn't think it was important to make too many decisions and commitments from across the ocean. I know it stresses some people out, but I find it freeing not to have to decide where I'm staying or which way I'm going until the last minute, basically when I'm already there. Greece, being a hugely popular tourist destination, had no shortage of places to stay and great itineraries, so we did some research ahead of time, but left most of the decision making till the end. There was a heat wave, drought, and wildfire situation in the country around the time of our arrival, which influenced some of our decisions as well. In Athens, we explored some museums and put our bikes together in preparation to depart. The direction was finally chosen and we set out south towards the Port of Piraeus. Riding out of Athens was like riding out of most big cities, a little irritating but there are a few dedicated lanes that made it a little more pleasant, even though we had to climb some stairs once or twice. A little further along the way we met some curious friendly locals who informed us that we just climbed the second tallest hill in Piraeus. There was a significant haze in the air from recent wildfires and it was oppressively hot. We rode past the huge port town to a smaller one called Parama and took a short ferry ride to the island of Salamina. The ferry was the kind you could drive a car onto, and it had multiple decks. We were on the lower deck with all the cars. I was just trying to enjoy the view. As soon as we got off the boat, the dense urban sprawl was replaced with quiet country living. After riding over a small hill, we found ourselves riding along a cove with sandy beaches. We couldn't help ourselves and went right in the water without even changing out of our cycling clothes. It was a great relief from the heat. Just a bit further along the bay, we had our first run-in with the trip's arch nemesis, but more on that later. When we reached the opposite end of Salamina, we took an even shorter ferry ride back to the mainland. The moon had just come up, and we only had a few hours of daylight, so we started thinking about where to stay. We knew there'd be a small hotel in nearby Megara, so we booked it for the night and headed in that direction. We took the scenic route along the coast and passed a charming little marina in a town called Pachi. It was getting late and I thought maybe we could stay here for the night. Our Megara reservation came with no cancellation fee, so we traded it for a small B&B apartment I spotted on a tiny ad on the side of a building in town. We had our first dinner of the trip along the water, with a bunch of cats running between our feet, and you can say we severely underestimated the portion sizes. The next day, our journey took us further west towards ancient Corinth. We crossed a small canal separating the mainland from Peloponnes, a large peninsula slash island that we'll be spending the rest of our trip on. We sped past the canal and spent a significant portion of the rest of the day riding along the coast. We stopped at a tiny beach again to cool off. It was completely empty except for one fisherman. Part of the reason we chose this route was to be close to the water and be able to jump in whenever we wanted. We were happy to indulge. At lunch I finally got some fresh grilled sardines that I was desperately searching all around Portugal for last year and couldn't find. Shared a little with this guy. As we got closer to our destination, we began to see this giant hill in the distance. It was kind of magical looking in the residual haze and setting sun. It turned out to be the hill the Acropolis of Corinth was built on and there were ruins up there to go and explore. Fortunately we didn't have to climb the hill, as the town of Corinth was situated right next to it with its own set of impressive ruins. 
As I took photos of the moon rising over the temple of Apollo, I noticed people entering the site after hours. It turned out there was an open-air opera being performed, free to the public, in probably the most remarkable setting you could possibly imagine. If I wasn't starving from riding all day, I'd probably stay longer even though opera isn't really my preferred genre. In the morning, we went to explore Acro Corinth. After a second daytime visit to the main ruins in town, we took a cab up the hill, which had some pretty remarkable views. All the exploring made it difficult to get a whole day of riding in, though Bobby did decide to ride back to the canal and come back. We decided to stay in Corinth another night before heading out further along the peninsula. On the next day's ride, one of the day's stops was on the ruins of ancient Nemea. It was a bit smaller than some of what we saw in Athens and Corinth, but there was an impressive ruin of the Temple of Zeus that dates back to the 4th century BC. The riding was becoming more scenic with distant blue hills all around us and groves of old olive trees and cypresses lining the road. I was mesmerized by this tiny hill with what looked like castle ruins on top, shining in the sun. At dusk we reached our destination, which was the town of Mykines, chosen because it was next to yet another set of ruins to explore. Next day, rinse and repeat, this time though at the ruins of ancient Mycenae with an overcast sky which is rather fitting given the tragic history of this place. The site itself was a bit less visually striking, with no tall columns, but there was a great museum on site along with this creepy tomb to explore. We intentionally came this way because we wanted to see a lot of culture, but we were also starting to realize that there are so many sites in such a small area that we have to pick and choose which ones to see and which ones to skip. Once the day's explorations were done, we rode a short distance to the town of Argos for lunch. Argos is one of the oldest continuously populated cities in the world. The castle on the hill I saw earlier is located here on yet another Acropolis, which just means city on a hill in Greek in case you were wondering. We settled for looking at it from below and continued our ride towards the Gulf of Argolis and the city of Napfleo. Here again we ran into our old enemy, and I know what you're thinking, and no, it's not dogs. I'm kind of known for uh, complaining about dogs chasing me, and Greece has a reputation in the bike touring circles for aggressive dogs, though we found them to be pretty well behaved in our trip. No, the real enemy was this insidious goat head thorn. Natalie had two flats on the first day of riding, another on the second day of riding, and when we were coming out of Argos, we rode through a big fat patch of these things. They are an annoying invasive plant that grows all over the place and is pretty unremarkable looking and easy to miss. Its thorns are really sharp and pierce tires easily. Natalie was getting the worst of it because she had supple gravel tires that would usually be run tubeless while Bobby and I had touring tires with the added flat protection that comes with. After experiencing all the joy of patching tubes daily and changing several flats on the road, Natalie finally went to a bike shop to replace the tubes with some sealant and never had another flat on the trip. Even the touring tires got at least one or two flats, so it's definitely something to watch out for if you're riding in this part of the world. Nafplio was a busy city with lots of historical sites and was actually briefly the capital of Greece in the 19th century. Our first impression that it was a bit too touristy, but we still chose to stay another night when we realized how much there was left to see. There were nice cobblestone streets, several castles, and there was even a beach at one side of town. It was only the fifth day of the riding portion of the trip, we were already taking our second rest day. It made for an unimpressive mileage total, but it left more time to take photos photos of castles, photos of ruins, photos of landscapes, and photos of cats. There were a lot of cats, and many of them were very friendly, especially if you gave them food. A bunch of adorable beggars. We climbed the castle above the city to take in the views before packing up to hit the road again the next day. After Nopfleo, 
we crossed back to the north coast of Peloponnes, and the rest of our trip was spent riding east towards Poros. We explored an ancient theater in Epidavros, an incredibly well-preserved site with dramatic scenery that served as the backdrop to many plays in antiquity. The seaside town of ancient Epidavros was a peaceful place to spend the night with lots of affordable lodging options. The riding along the coast had some stunning paved ups and downs. We ran into the only other set of touring cyclists of the whole trip on this stretch, a lovely couple from Australia that were smiling the whole time. We stopped for the night in the volcanic town of Methana. Our first impression that we made a huge mistake. There was a thick sulfur smell, like rotten eggs, coming towards us that kept getting stronger until we reached the source at the entrance of the city. It was this terrifying pool of milky water next to an abandoned hotel that apparently people bathe in. I was not going anywhere near it. Luckily though, the wind pulled all of that smell away from the actual center of the city where we would stay and we can actually enjoy a meal without puking. A nice French couple we met, who also bike tour but were not touring in this particular trip, took this photo of us holding our noses. Just like last year, the end of our trip was marked by rain. We delayed our departure to wait out the worst of it. Once we got going, the last day of riding was probably the most beautiful of the whole trip. We rode through this dirt road along an olive farm with pines and stunning coastline views at every turn. The coast of love apparently, and I totally loved it. After a few more amazing miles along the coast, we arrived in Galatas. It's a small port town a short distance away from the island of Poros, not to be confused with the island of Paros. We took a 10 minute ferry ride and set our things down at a hotel in the harbor. Strangely, Poros was not even mentioned in my Greece travel guidebook, but has a ton of yachts and tourists along with the usual fare of restaurants and gift shops. The town in the hills behind the harbor was incredibly picturesque. We walked around the tiny alleys with colorful windows and doorways for a little while until the rains came back. We chose Poros to end our ride in because there's a fairly quick ferry back to Athens that runs frequently from here. We were delayed by weather again, but eventually got going and made it back to the city in time for yet another deluge of rain. I'd be lying if I said food wasn't a motivation for choosing to go to Greece. The food was terrific, though I wouldn't say I was blown away. Probably my expectations were sky high and were met, though not exceeded. I can imagine. You guys have not disappointed. Uh, something I learned was basically every dish can improve with capers. I usually have a jar in back of my fridge, but since coming back from Greece, I've added capers to more and more food. One standout meal was this appetizer of shrimp in a lemon sauce with some incredibly fresh and flavorful capers. I regret not getting seconds. One area that did far exceed our expectations was hospitality. At times I couldn't believe I was in Europe, where I regularly expect surly and indifferent staff. On at least three occasions, the hotel workers offered to let us pay less for our stay, completely unprompted. One amazing place we stayed in particular was Le Petit Planet in Mykines. Besides having this beautiful view from the courtyard, the lady who ran it was incredibly sweet to us. She even offered to drive us the kilometer or two to the ruins so we wouldn't have to lock up our bikes, and gave us a guidebook to borrow. We found Greek people to be extremely warm and friendly the whole trip, always eager to help us get the most enjoyment out of their country.
This awesome pita sandwich was the first thing we ate in Athens and also the last. We did one last bit of sightseeing and then had the joy of carrying our bike boxes across town to our Airbnb where we would have to pack them up. As with most trips, I feel like it was a bit too short and went by too fast. I hope to come back and see the rest of the peninsula along with more of the mainland and maybe more of the islands as well. Big thanks to Bobby and Natalie for being rad travel buddies and not complaining when I spent hours taking the same photo over and over again. Also thanks to my friend Manny who gave some great advice on where to go and what to see. This video took a long time to release because of how much effort it takes to organize my thoughts and all that kind of stuff. Leave a comment if it was useful and at least somewhat enjoyable. Uh, thanks for watching.